Labs, um, and which is one of the entities that has brought Dr. Musawi here to speak with us. Uh, Dr. Musawi is also speaking here during International Week and um, is also brought to us by the Center for Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies. So he's here for uh, several institutional uh, reasons. And um, I would like to uh, invite all of you to uh, stay after the, the lecture for a question and answer session. Uh, so Dr. Masari will speak and we can um, answer some uh, questions and answers. And let me uh, introduce you. Dr. Musawi, who comes to us from New York City, from Columbia University, where he's professor of Arabic and Comparative Studies. Uh, he is the editor, he's a very busy man. He's the editor for the Journal of Arabic Literature and the author of 28, 28 books published in both English and Arabic. Among them include Scheherazade in England, 19th century criticism of the Arabian Nights, the post-colonial Arabic novel, Arabic Poetry traje Trajectories of Modernity and Tradition, Reading Iraq, The Islamic Context of the Thousand and One Nights, and Islam on the Street. Among his forthcoming books is Arab Popular Revolutions, Staging Collective Will, who is the recipient of the Oasis Award in Literary Criticism. Today's lecture is entitled Islam on the Street, and it builds on Dr. Musawi's book, Islam on the Street, which has won the Choice Outstanding Academic Title for 2010. This book argues that the reasons behind the failure of the elite and thereby the Arab nation state in forging the right emotive links with the masses, their faith and popular beliefs, or, uh, which, which has been referred to, is being referred to as Islam on the Street or Popular Islam, this lack of, of making the right emotive connection has set the stage for all the popular unrest and consequent uprisings that we have seen in the past year and, uh, and building up previous. His argument makes use of narrative and poetry to come closer to the political unconscious and discern the inevitability of change and the rise of a moderate Islam as evidence now in Tunisia. I'd like to welcome Dr. Musawi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for making this possible for me to come over and to give this story to you. So today then, I go directly to Sefer, I should uh, thank Ralph, uh, Renin, and uh, Salam uh, for making this visit possible. And thank you all for coming and joining. And uh, so today then, what I'm going to address is Islam on the Street, which happened to be also the title of a book which I wrote. But today I'm going to move a little bit far from what I wrote then and I try to see exactly other questions which have been circulated in the minds of very many people. What is meant exactly by Islam on the street? How we should be addressing such a question? So all of you perhaps know what is Islam anyway. So there is no reason to go about that. But exactly, politically speaking, how we define Islam, that is a problematic by itself. And especially when we look at that in terms of uh, cultural and political conflict, and when this is put also in terms of interest. So usually in political discourse, usually we use terms according to our own interests, and we need uh, to redirect our assumptions and readings of other cultures, generally speaking, including religions, according to these. So we are talking about actually a dominating discourse or an official or formal discourse and other discourses. There is always then an official, formal discourse and there is always the rest of discourses. These, the rest of discourses, are very many and they have their own multiplicities, like how it should be. There is no religion which can claim that it is one unitary discourse. It is how you read religion yourself. Remember that if it is divinely inspired religion, then the assumption is that it is given to you as a human. And being a human for that matter, it means that you are using it according to your own wishes and definitely interpretations and interests. That is how it goes. So then, but at the same time, there are a number of rituals and there are a number of things which are agreed upon principles. These are usually taken for granted by very many people, but even these are interpreted or reinterpreted accordingly. And this is 
now you find that law is coming in the middle in order to organize all these things. This is why there is an Islamic law. And when you try to see what is meant by Islamic law, you are going to find that actually we are talking about four principal Islamic law schools. That is, the Shia is not included. So we, then who said that then? Why are we talking about four? Why are we not going to be inclusive enough as to include also the Shi'is, the Khadijins, and the other groups. That is the formal discourse. That is the official discourse. This is why we speak about an official discourse. An official discourse should negate the other in order to have all the space to itself. And certainly it should be derogatory so far as the other is concerned. You should put it aside. And that is exactly also what is happening. So in religion then, we are talking about interest too. And this is why we are talking also about official religion and non-official religion. That is something which we need to understand. In order to be reasonable human beings, that is to say we can argue a case back and forth, then we need to have all these considerations in mind that a religion, even to its own people who call themselves Muslim, is not one and the same. That usually, like any other religion, like Christianity, like Judaism, like whatever, it has a culture of its own. It is only when you read it as a culture that you are beyond the constraints and the structures which are imposed on that kind of religion. Now, that is problematic by itself, as I said, because not very many people are going to accept your argument that it is a culture. Not very many. There are people who don't like that word because they think that is too basic for them. They want to be very restrictive. They want to be uh, to oblige you to do the few things which they have in mind, not what you are thinking of, and so on. So there are problems with the religions then, and these are applicable to Islam as they are applicable to Christianity, by the way. So this is why, at a certain time, the Catholic Church was not well received in England, as you know, and it was fought against, and so on. That is, again, normal. We are, because we are speaking the same thing when you speak about Italy or France at that time, when they look at the Protestant and so on. So we need to look at these things and see them in terms of politics then, and at the same time, in terms of interest. And we shouldn't really try to make an argument simply because we happen to be in conflict with a specific culture for a specific reason, or because an official discourse is trying to promote a certain agenda at the expense of another. All these should be taken into consideration whenever we are trying to be very reasonable in our considerations. Now, was Islam itself, as in Islam, received as one unitary, as I said, discourse um, in, in the Arab region itself? No. No. Actually, with the, with the, with the encounter with Europe, uh, throughout the 19th century, you find that you find that you have very many groups, religious people who are still adamant in their, in their understanding of Islam as a specific uh, principle. And there are sheikhs who are very broad-minded, including the Mufti at that time, Sheikh Muhammad Abd Abdu in Egypt, and who are ready certainly to go beyond that interpretation and to argue in very many articles and books that actually the encounter with you should be taken heartedly in the sense that it gives you a lot of information about the culture and the growth of science which should be taken seriously as the Arabs took it seriously long time ago, centuries ago when they were uh, uh, witnessing the peak of civilization at that time. This is how they related to Greek philosophy, for instance, and science, and so on. And, and so that is an argument by itself. And Sheikh Muhammad Abdu and the others were very uh, much receptive at the same time to the women issues. And this is why they were attending the salons, women's salons. They were sheikhs, and they were attending women's salons, and they were making their arguments, and they were listening to ladies who are uh, uh, making uh, a certain argument regarding women rights and so on. So they have all this kind of dialogue and we shouldn't be think that it was a closed system. These shares, as I said, you can use the term liberal without the political connotation, liberal-minded, 
individuals who have been participating in the makeup of what we call Arab awakening. That is to say, through the encounter with Europe, there was a possibility of back and forth. That kind of attitude. Not under them, no longer under the Ottoman Empire, which had been occupying all this region, certainly, and had been developing sort of a restrictive discourse for some time. Not necessarily, I mean, that should not be generalized, because we know that there were very many other exceptions within that, but it is good to have this in mind and to argue accordingly. Then you have very many Arab intellectuals who are coming from the encounter with Europe. That is, they are studying or whatever, and they are coming back, and they are arguing right now not against religion as a form of discourse. They are arguing against superstitions, what they call it. That is to say, popular beliefs that were practiced among the masses. That is, they know that is against the scientism which they are learning and which they are promoting. So they were fighting against these. And you find early on in the 20th, uh, 20th century, very many of these Arab intellectuals trying to argue back, trying to argue an elitist kind of discourse against the masses. That is because they know they are the ones who are coming with the enlightenment. Remember that the enlightenment, if you write it with capital letter, it means that you are talking about the enlightenment in Europe, the 18th century. That is the celebration of reason at the expense of other things, including emotion and passion, which could be according to the philosophers of the uh, age and according to empirical philosophy, generally speaking, that only certainly will be uh, so misleading the mind from its potential interest and the kind of rational reasoning which is assumed to be. Uh, so that is then under the impact of that enlightenment capitalized, there was a discourse growing among Arab intellectuals at that time which had been at the same time negating whatever that has been associated with superstitions, popular beliefs, visitations, shrines, and so on. All practices and rituals which we associate with the popular mind. Now, how do we see that? You find that very many of them will be using the trap, T-R-O, T in this case, of the lamb. The lamb is light and they use it in their own discussion. So, but the lamp itself will be a kind of trajectory that you use it or you reject it. If you associate it with superstition, according to your knowledge, then it is rejected. And this is why you find, for instance, one of the prolific and very influential writers early on in the 20th century, Yahya Haqqi, wrote his Saint's Lamp, an author. Very interesting novel, very short, novel actually, in which he talked against the shrine of Sayyid Zainab in the middle of Cairo, and where supposedly the protagonist's place, his house, is there. So that is, he was watching how people are doing their visitations, how they go to the shrine, how they show, how they do their prayers, and so on and so on. And when he came back as a medical doctor, specialist in the eyes in this case, when he is coming back, he was comparing what he saw in Scotland at that time with what was available in that quarter, in that popular kind of district. And he felt that he should fight because people still believe that everything is coming from the shrine to them. That is, even if you do that, is your prayers and your visitations rightly and uh, to the same designer that is, the saint in this case, who is, uh, I mean, with the prophet certainly, and in, in this case, if you do all these services, you might even be cured from illnesses. Whatever popular beliefs were there, and he tried to use his knowledge in order to defy that kind of popular faith, and at the same time to bring his knowledge, which he got in England as a student at that time. And so he used the practical medicine which he knew. And however, that was not leading to any improvement in the eyes of father and his cousin. 
and that was a problem for him. That was a problem for him because he thought that it, whatever he had known as knowledge should be the right way, the right method, the enlightened way. But he noticed that the, the, the Fatma in this case believed so much in the shrine and in the visitations that she was not receptive to that kind of medication. That's the problem. Look at the, at the problem, how it is. So he went to the shrine and there was in the shrine the lamp, which its oil is being used for very many medications. And he broke it into pieces. He smashed it. And certainly people who were visitors at that time were about to kill him because that is to them a very much blasphemous act. I mean, it should not happen. Anyway, but that later on, at a later stage, he changed himself and he decided that science by itself is not enough. You need to bring popular belief and science together and work accordingly and gradually. What is the lesson which we are get getting from that? That is the understanding that actually there is a popular belief. That the popular belief is not necessarily conducive to any uh, cure or improvement in the society, but you cannot negate it completely. And it is good if you bring the popular belief and science together and work accordingly until an actual enlightenment or change take place in the, society, in the societies or not. Just leave the societies as they are. What I'm saying is that what we have then, we have an intellectual who is working according to what he learned and he thought this is the only way for improvement. And you have the other role, the middle role, let us say, which thinks that it is only through this kind of appropriation of any knowledge within the popular mind or the popular belief that you can devise a way to reach what you want. So we are talking, this, the lamp simple will continue. It will be used by other writers, certainly. And, and uh, later on in the 70s, the, the Egyptian novelist Najib Mahfouz, who got the Nobel Prize, for instance, wrote a kind of travelogue uh, called uh, The Journey of Ibn Fattuma, because he was referring to a traveler whose name was Ibn Fattuma, a Moroccan who traveled all the way across Asia. And, and, uh, and uh, he, he used the same, or he played on the name. And the name of the protagonist is Qandil, meaning lamb. Again, the lamb. Look at the association. Qandil's knowledge in uh, Mahfouz's novel is an effort to go and to travel because, not because you are under the impact of wanderlust, no, but because you are so discontented with the whole situation and on the social, political, religious level that you decided to go and see for yourself your knowledge of whatever system is applicable to your country. And you go to a number of Muslim countries and you are annoyed by the fact or by what you see as a fact that this is not the Islam, this is hypocrisy, this is such, this is such, and so on. And then you will go to other cities, to other places, in which you see a capitalist system, a communist system, and so on. He's not calling them by their name, but he, it is almost allegorical, something similar. And he will go through that until there is the ideal stage, which, in which he disappeared, because nobody usually reached that land and telling us what he saw. This is the end. Supposedly, this is the time of transfiguration in which the human usually merge into something of a divine, let us say, like the Sufi journey, in which you get enough knowledge, but you don't know what kind of knowledge you have been receiving. This is the ultimate, the ultimate journey. So he stops at that. The papers which we read are the papers which cover the journey before the last. Now, what is Mahmoud is trying to tell you that there is nothing ultimate. There is no ideal society. This is impossibility. You shouldn't, that is the human. The human should understand that there is always a limit and there is always a search. And that is something which, is, which could be accommodated. Without insulting popular belief or highlighting scientism, you should move, move a little bit more slowly with belief and understand people as they practice these beliefs and rituals. And, and have respect for it instead of working against it. 
So you find that, that a large number of Arab intellectuals would be moving according to that line, with the understanding then that there is a divide between the elite, the enlighteners, who thought that, that they can immediately bring knowledge and improvement to the society. They are the leaders of the society. And the sample which they are using, as long as Europe itself in the 18th century had witnessed uh, that kind of achievement in which the philosophers, generally speaking, played a major role, they can do the same. They dissociated that, that the growth of that philosophy happened to be coinciding also with two more important facts. One of them, the rise of colonialism, that is very important certainly, and at the same time also capitalism. And he, they, he, they, they didn't associate the rise of philosophy and later on the positivist mind itself to what is going in the society itself and the expansion outside and so on. They try to read it in their own terms. And this is certainly it's not helping a lot. Because what happened, they came and they came one sided to their societies. And they tried to devise and to make claims to change without going and striking emotive links with the masses. Because what you need usually in order to change is that you need to have emotive links with the masses to see how you can exchange with them. It is not enough what you believe in. It is very important to see how people act, how they believe, and they how the, uh, and how they respond. This is Islam on the street. Islam on the street then is the Islam of the multitudes, of the people whom you haven't been thinking highly of. These are the people who make their rituals. They make their beliefs. You cannot impose on them a kind of an elitist discourse which we associate usually with the official discourse. That is to say, the formal official discourse which feels that it can lead and it can impose its will on the society. And this should not be taken lightly, by the way, because whenever it comes to the discussion of any topic, social or, or political, usually authorities, generally speaking, go to religion because they need the support of the religion. And there is always ulama, that is sheikhs or whatever, the clergy, available to support. So they can be uh, co-opted as part of that official discourse. And suddenly you find the state and the clergy working together in order to impose on the masses their own discourse. And I mean in matters which are very serious in the consideration of the future of nations. So, now, the problem with that kind of discourse is that when there was an anti-colonial struggle in these countries, especially in the Arab West, that is, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, this, and Mauritania, whenever you think of this land, it is not what is applicable there, is not necessarily applicable to the East, to the Arab East, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, the UAE, Saudis, and Yemen, for instance. It is not, not necessarily. We shouldn't take this lightly, too. Because why? Why do we say that, that there is another line? We need to see that not only that the background for Arab West has a lot of Sufism in it. It is not only that, because you can argue that Islamic law and the Malik school is applicable there. This is part of the issue. The other issue is that these people, under the Ottoman, for a long time also, they have developed a different understanding of Arabism and Islamism. That is how they bring the two together. And this is when the Iraq-Iran war erupted, for instance, they were against it. Completely against it. They were not ready to listen to you. If you argue the case from an Iranian point of view or from an Iraqi point of view, they think that this is wrong simply because it is against Muslims. Some point. for them. That is. So they, there is no separation for them. And this is why you find the nationalist discourse lost a lot in the Iraqi-Iran war. It lost a lot in that region especially. And nationalism, generally speaking, as the elections is telling you in Tunisia, for instance, law. It used 
It used to be very popular. Right now it comes almost four or five. After the Nahla party, the Islamic party, and the other parties, the Democrat, and so on. So, generally speaking, the moderate platform is winning over, which tells you that people are ready to go to some moderation in between, and they are not very supportive of any radicalism of any sort. And that is what is happening nowadays. So we need to understand that. What happened itself to the, to the, uh, to the issue of the rancher and the nation state? I mean, when it comes to colonialism, we know that it is possible, like what happened in the Arab West, for instance, it is possible to fight against the French, for instance, occupation, under the banner of both Islam and Arabism, which they did, by the way. Ben Badis in Algeria, that is how he worked out. Before him, Prince Abdul Qadir al Jazari did the same. Omar al Mukhtar did the same against the Italians in, Italy, uh, in uh, Libya. So you have all these men. That is very important for us to see in the anti colonial struggle. There is a possibility then of bringing these discourses together, and Islam could be used as a fighting force in this case as a fighting force against the colonial, and it was uh, used in the Arab West, as I told you, very successfully. You don't need, I mean, you have leaders, definitely, like the names which I mentioned, but these are not necessarily with, I mean, uh, the only people. You have the masses behind them. All these people who are ready to believe in that kind of way are ready to, to fight back which they did. They did it in Sudan, too. And that is something which we need to know. Then you have then the emergence of the nation state, the post-independence state. And the emergence of the nation state is taking over with a secular discourse. That is to say, generally speaking, that everything is secularized, but in the Constitution there is always a belief, an emphasis, that this is an Islamic nation. Meaning that they apply the necessary beliefs, that's all. That's all. And usually you have the clergy in support. Like El Azhar in Egypt was for a long time very much in line with the nation state. It did not deviate. They agreed on what is agreeable. And that is that this is not necessarily representative, again, of the masses, not necessarily. Usually, they bring about a kind of common discourse, which is possibly successful. But this, we should remember, can be used both ways against anything. Let us say there is some radical movement or political movement, and the government is against it. They can ask the clergy, to issue a fatwa, that is a proclamation, saying that this is against Islam. And so, so politically then, religion can be used within the formal discourse or the official discourse which we are talking about. Now, how is it possible for the elite to change, or do they change? I mean, the elite for a long time are secularized, meaning that they have been very much influenced by what they have been reading, and they thought that this is the way that usually the movement is forward towards scientific knowledge and analysis, and this is why religion should be put aside. And that is very important for them for, let us say, 20 years or so. It was successful as a discourse, because you find the rising middle class very much concerned with its own interest, uh, interest and so on. And, and the kind of education, which is important to play in the game, has been going in that direction. That is, religion as a, as, as a course, which is given in the secondary school and primary schools usually, uh, all over the region, is very minor. And people are allowed the freedom to attend or not attend. It is like sport, so you have two usually courses, which can be overlooked by students, sports and religion, minimized today. And so that was over the curriculum, if you look at it, for over 30 years or so, in, after the nation state. 
And this will continue. After 1967, that is the defeat of the Arab when the Israeli uh, attack was uh, the preemptive uh, Israeli attack was done in 1967 mostly against Egypt and, and so on. There was a problem of uh, frustration, discontent, and disappointment all over the region. All over the region, but especially in Egypt. Because the, the, the propaganda or the national discourse for a long time had been telling them of the power of Egypt, of the power of this nationalist discourse, of the power of the leader, of this and, and all these achievements. And they took it for granted for a long time. When the defeat came, they were, as I told you, not only disappointed, certainly very much discontented. Where should the elite stand in this case? Because it was discredited. Nobody is going to believe in it anymore, you see. And this is why you find a large number of intellectuals decide to revise their reading again and try to address the society differently. And this is why you find very many of them writing differently and especially in narrative, including Mahfoul, the Nobel Prize winner, will be writing differently. He is no longer concerned with the middle classes or with bureaucracies. He will be writing about, about Islamic popular faith. This is why a novel is called Harafish, the Bakapos, the people who are on the margins. This is the novel about that. And, and the one which I mentioned, the trouble law, and so on. And he would go back to Sufis and mysticism and so on. That is trying to connect again with the masses because he felt that they had been really betrayed for a long time and that the national discourse has been successful, has not been successful enough as to achieve any kind of connection or emotive link with these, uh, with these masses. That is important for us to notice. Now what we have then after 1967 is a reversal in the sense that very many intellectuals will be writing differently, trying to strike emotive links with the masses, but at the same time, that is one side you have a vacuum. Because the nation state has been doing what? Has been uh, having a number of crackdowns on whatever thought of as against it, as a power, organized politics, a communist or whatever leftist group, and, and so on. So they suffered, most of the political parties suffered or eliminated almost. This is why you have, after 1967, a vacuum in very many parts of the region. And in this case, who is going to jump in? Movements. Some of them, the Islamists and so on, other groups, organized groups, are going to jump in and make use of that platform because people are, as I told you, so frustrated that they need somebody to speak for them. And that will take place uh, for some time. Certainly, this will be consolidated, uh, consolidated too by the fact that the nation state, after the defeat, has not taken the lesson. And instead of going back to actual democracies, they have been revising the agenda in order to make themselves too empowered to be dislocated. That is to say, what they did, they, the family and the cronies of whoever is leading will be trying to control the economy, to strike a back with uh, late capitalist industry, generally speaking, and corporations, and have the open door policy, the open market economy, and so on. As you know, most of these states have been offering their, their, their citizens a kind of benefits, free education, free health system, uh, services, and so on. Right now, with this kind of open door policy, what you have a lot of privatization, that is certainly the bankruptcy of very many small businesses, the uh, disruption or even the elimination of very many middle class uh, power centers, and so on. And you end up really with more poverty, certainly, and at the same time with more disenchantment. And that is, again, what is happening. And so the Islamists, certainly, that is the radical Islamic groups will take over. Because that is a very good vacuum for them to thrive. And that is what they, what they did for some time, certainly. But as I told you, the problem with, the, with the, any religious organization is that sooner or later it will fail, too. 
because of the limits of organization, that is to say, you cannot continue building your argument a large, among a large group of people. You, if you are too organized, too tightly organized, unless you are uh, fluent enough as to reach everybody and to be capable of appropriating very many of your beliefs and strategies, you might fail. And unless you rise to the challenge, at the same time, if you are going to limit yourself and discourse to specifics separately, especially regarding worship and whatever, you are going to uh, limit the range of your followers, and that is, as I said, will be happening shortly. Now, the, look at the, at the example here which we have. Before that, the intellectual, this is how they respond. That is to say, they used to think about religion as useless. Useless. It is ineffective. And that will continue for some time. It is ineffective for them. And uh, uh, it might be wiser to have something instead. And, and this, as I said, very many will continue arguing in the same way, or even to make fun of the scriptures, that is to say. And they don't mind. Poets and so on will be in that line of thought. And remember that this is a serious loss for them, because yes, they have readers, but in the long run, the masses will not read that. And, and this is the amount, I mean, look at the poems here. For instance, rewriting the Quranic verse in such a way as to associate the poet with the rebel, that is, and the religious discourse with rebellion. For some time, yes, it was very successful, but as I told you, after the disaster of 1967, it won't work anymore. And this is Bulan bin Haydari, the Iraqi, also the same thing. So for a long time, they took it for granted that actually if there was any bankruptcy, it was due, I mean, religious or political or cultural, it was due to these beliefs, superstitions in this case, and so on. So for a long time then, we had this issue. Now, when it is problematized, it is problematized in certain narratives, like the one which we are quoting right now, that is Zaini Baratak by an Egyptian called uh, Jamal Ghitani, for instance. What he did, he decided he cannot criticize the nation state. Impossible for him to do so. So the wisest way is to go back in history, centuries before that, and to build the narrative. And which, in which the narrative, there is the security service, Certainly, and there is also the struggle for benefits and interest within that, and how religion is being manipulated and used. That is to say, what he is doing through that novel is a parody of the nation state, how the nation state changes its discourse every now and then in order, in order to deceive more of the masses and to continue on control. And this is, in, in this novel especially, the emphasis is laid on the power of the security service, which is quite true. The nation state has been powerful in the state for a long time, as the regimes, that is, which I talk about some of them right now and so on. Uh, these, they have strong security officers. But they couldn't understand that the security they, will, they will, the, the moment they see that the population is against them, they disappear, and that is what happened on the scene in Tunisia and Egypt, for instance, the same thing, or even in Egypt. Supposedly very strong, certainly, and they were penetrating every part of the society, but in the end, they disappear. They vanish. You don't find them. They are not ready, certainly, to sacrifice their life, life for, for, for a regime which everybody is saying that goes for up. And, and so what he did before that, long time before that, the novelist tried to build that kind of party and to prepare us for what is going to happen later. What brought him, however, more is, 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 is how to bring the aftermath. Okay, there is a critique of that. How is it possible to go beyond what is taking place in the regime, in the nation state itself, to go beyond it and to see, is it possible for religion to go back to the masses and to build a new argument? Yes. And this is why they, you find that the sheikh 
or the Sufis, the Sufi shares, the clergy, that is the Sufi clergy, the mystical side, are going to join in the narrative at least, reconstruct it in such a way as to join hands with the rebels, with the factors in one way or another, to be one path. And that is also, again, reconstructed in these narratives. Very important for us to see that these narratives have already reconstructed what we are seeing and watching in these popular revolutions later. They were already preparing the mind for that and building certainly that kind of a bridge with the masses. And, and, and that is so, I mean, the intellectual of early on in the 19th century, 20th century, is no longer the same one which we are witnessing later, who decided no that it is the benefit of narrative to reconstruct itself in such a manner as to fit into the popular belief. And to bring that popular belief, again, from the masses and bridge it with the so-called elite, right now the educated segment of the society, and let them work together. The clergy, is, in this case, should be revising its own agenda, working differently, and coming uh, into the same organization. All this is the, 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 the kind of narrative in which are constructed certainly very many points of view. We don't need to worry about these because as I told you, I mean, that is the uh, significant thing about it. Generally speaking, though, you find that some of the narratives are still critical of a specific clergy. That is the clergy which has nothing else, no job to do, just giving the sermon and leave and getting the salary at the end. That continues, as you know, in the nation state for a long time. Why do we say that? Actually, most of these people who go and give their, their service are paid clergy. That is to say, they are part of the nation state. They are giving the same even to see, to, to repeat. And this is why if you happen to be in some of the countries, you will see that or you will hear that the sermon which you hear on this Friday at this mosque is the same one which is repeated in the other mosque and so on, because it is one version. And it is given to them and they are paid for that. Now this is, in these popular revolutions, and this is expected in this kind of narrative, which was written uh, early on, as I said, uh, uh, it was expected that these people will be exposed sooner or later and some other clergy will take over who belong to the society, who will belong to the, uh, to the masses. So, uh, uh, yeah, that is something for us. You find, for instance, in, in other narratives, in other narratives, not only the emphasis on this kind of conflict, <coughs> and the definition of the clergy, and how is it possible to argue there is a clergy which is part of the official formal discourse of the nation state, and the clergy which can fit into the popular movement and into the popular belief. Aside from that, no, you have others who try to see what is the problem with the Muslim Brotherhood, for instance, and Sufism. You cannot argue the, the Muslim Brotherhood, for instance, in countries like Iran. It doesn't work. Simply because there is yeah, is it? there is a conflict within a number of discourses, with some are conservative, some are, are liberal or open, and so on, and some in, be in between. So you have all these. So we are not talking because the Muslim Brotherhood cannot exist in Iran. Simple. Right? So, uh, and so on. So we are talking then about, about, about different kinds of struggles which are emerging, like between the Sufis and the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is a very tightly organized society. It is capable of extending its social services to the masses, by the way. It is very good in attending the prisons and whatever and offering its own services. And this you can read it in a novel called The Logic house by uh, an uh, Egyptian named Khairi Shalabi, for instance, if you are interested in that. And in this Hassan's novel, Al Mahdi, a short novel actually, in which he tried to tell you what is the difference between Sufi and Dervish practices and the Muslim brothers. 
and, and, and the noise and of this kind of organization associated here in this narrative with the Muslim brothers is the one which is not trusted by the Sufis. The Sufis are more for worship and at the same time at the same time they don't they they, they dislike organization as such because they think that religion is not for them. Religion is faith. Simple for them. It's not political organization. That is different understanding. And you can tell that very many writers are on the side of that kind of faith, that kind of belief, because they are themselves quite afraid and sensitive of organized politics. Organized politics or organized religions can grow into an official discourse. That's the problem with it. And again, intellectuals are not ready to play the game again and to lose. And uh, so this is why you find that the, the, the emerging, the emerging segment, usually in societies in which religion has been a player for a long time, is a kind of devotion for mysticism or Sufism, that is Islamic uh, mystical understanding of religion. They have that. They have because there is more love in it, there is more attention in it, there is more care in it. But what they try to add to that is something else. That Sufism is not necessarily passive. That Sufism could be very activist. And this is why their Sufis are participants in rebellions. Then we have Mahfur in Arabian Nights and Days. Later on in his career, 19, that is 82, he, this is his Sufi. A Sufi is ready to take part in these kind of movements. And so, and you find other writers doing the same. That is very important for us to say. Actually, gradually, we are going to notice that very many poets and writers are going to join hands and suggesting to us that there will be an Islamic revolution, an Islamic awakening. They couldn't define what is meant by that. But remember that the early awakening, as it is called early on in the 20th century, was national, in the sense that it was a secularized discourse in which there is the concept and the situation is conceptualized. So it was a conceptualization of the nation, awakening in order to move from one stage to another, the post, uh, let us say, the post-Ottoman stage. Very much involved in Europe, that is the assumption. Right now, and in the 90s, you find, for instance, perhaps you have read uh, Yaqub Yan Bolding by another writer, al Iswani, in which there is a celebration of a possibility of an Islamic awakening. Now, let us work for that, because again, that novel, that narrative, is multiple narrative in the sense that there are very many voices, but one of the voices which is very strong is speaking about that, that there is a possibility. That voice also was standing against the clergy in Saudi Arabia who were in support of occupation, for instance, or military invasions and so on. So in the novel, he is playing against these voices. One voice, the conservative clergy, or the Saudi, let us say, clergy, and his supporters in Egypt and other countries, and the nation state discourse against another discourse, another discourse which is organized mostly among the students, which has a different understanding of how the fight should be. And they go back to the Arab West, which I mentioned earlier, that is the Arab West in which Arab and Islam or Arabism and Islamism are brought together in a modern style in order to join the fight against the colonial. Right now, it is against the nation state which is thought of as corrupt. And that is exactly what is happening lately. So what we have there, a fight against whatever is taking, uh, is taking uh, to be a unitary, closed, Islamist discourse which should be opposed. Intellectual, general speaking, will be functioning in that. You can certainly ask me why is it possible then to to speak in these terms? And here we are reaching these popular revolutions, and we are saying that the intellectuals have no role in these revolutions, which is quite true, and but not exactly. 
If you are thinking in terms that before intellectuals used to have a role, it is no longer the case. Because right now we are talking about the masses. Students, workers, peasants, uh, middle classes, all of them. And this kind of combination, all of them felt a kind of a grudge against the system. Not only against the regime, against a system. Against a system, and that was the fight. That was the fight between them and a system. It was not against a person. They need the person to be part, that's quite true, because the, 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 the person is the symbol of that kind of system. They don't need the intellectual to tell them right now what to do. They are doing it, because if you go early on in the century, these masses, which you have been thinking of as not necessarily knowledge of all, these people, whom you haven't been taken very seriously, are back to the streets to tell you we can say no right now to this kind of regime, which they did, which they did. They are not asking you to be classifying and to classify them according to race, gender, and the class, because they are coming from every group and they are joining hands together. They have a common, shared belief in the necessity of change, which is very important for them. It is not as uh, in the West, in the media, generally speaking, it is about democracy. It's not democracy right now. If you understand democracy of a number of political parties, just forget it. These people are not trying to come with an agenda. Right now, what they want is the change, and then the next step will be taken care of later. So it is not systematic in the sense that there is somebody who is preparing an agenda for this, and they are going to go step by step. No. The most important priority for them is the change, and later on, what comes later will follow. This is why the intellectual cannot, right at this very moment, Tell them what to do. They don't need it. They are working according to a different understanding. It's not an agenda, as I said. That is one thing. That is one thing. But we should not also neglect the fact that a large number of intellectuals have been preparing these very minds of the young people and others to come together in their narratives, in their writings, in their poetry, in their songs, they have been doing that. They have been preparing the ground for that kind of change. They don't need to come back and to leave because they have already been setting the ground for that kind of change which we are witnessing right now, which is simply again that the power of the street. Because it is in this power of the street in which the street or the square or whatever they are reclaimed from the nation state. They are reclaimed as a public property as a public sphere, which is used certainly democratically in this case by the people, by the masses, for their own purposes. That is the achievement, certainly. That is the achievement by, by, uh, by itself. And we should look at that, that what is happening with these masses, with their beliefs, and these streets and squares, this is what is happening is Islam, or the popular faith of the people, coming back to the street as a power that can reclaim its own power, its own identity, and to reclaim the place as theirs, as no longer the monopoly of the regime itself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Musawi, for that interesting presentation. And we would like to uh, remind the students that we um, will take questions for about 15, 20 minutes or so. And then we have been asked to ask you to remain for uh, filling out a survey, please. Um, so this will last the length of the class up to about 140. And it is, is this, this clock looks, it's, is it five after? So uh, let us open the floor for some questions for Dr. Musawi, please. And we have another mic for you. Was that Anna? There's another mic here. Okay. And so we'll also get help from Dr. Chang and Muhtasa. Yes, salam. Dr. Yusuf? Yes. Um, 
thank you for a very informative and interesting uh, talk. Um, based on the title of your uh, talk, Islam on the Street, um, the examples, most of the examples you cited come from the Arab world. But we know that, of course, the majority of Muslims are not Arabs. And I'm thinking in particular of countries like Pakistan, where when five years ago there were some cartoons of made in Denmark of the Prophet Muhammad, and most of the reaction actually came from non-Arab countries, Muslim countries like Pakistan, Indonesia, and so on. The masses took to the streets demonstrating against cartoons that were displayed in, displayed in newspapers in Denmark. Uh, so, the reaction of the masses here at this level. Now, it's different from official Islam because, you know, Azhar and Azhar and so on also criticize those cartoons. But what I'm trying to get at is, how do you gauge that difference between you know, Muslims that are non-Arabs, right, and Mus Mus Muslims that are Arabs, and then the reaction to some other more significant events like, you know, the 9-11. We also know the difference between the reaction in Pakistan and the reaction in Arab countries. Thank you. Yeah, uh, two things. The first one is that Arabs don't take religion as they just do. By the way, I mean, despite the fact that everybody associates Islam with the Arabs, simply because it was born there, the Arabs are the least usually religious. Unfortunately, I mean that. By the way, if you read through, you find that they are not very practical in, 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 in so far as religion goes. The new phenomenon which you see that there are people attending mosques and with more than usual, this is recent, you know, in the last 20, 30 years. It wasn't there before. The Arabs were the least, and according to the statistics, that is what we should understand. The young generation take it for granted that the Arabs are very religious. They are not. I mean, in comparison with people who took Islam later, at a later period, they take it more seriously and they practice it differently. That is something which we know. That is one point. The other thing is that the nation state, their regimes have been practicing more violence on beliefs in the Arab world than in Asia. In Pakistan, in Indonesia, and other places, you find that the nation state has not having crackdowns on your beliefs and faiths. They do it on different scale. Unless you are military organized against them, that's all. But not against you. This is why relatively, in Asia, there is a kind of democracy. Afghanistan is an exception. It's an exception because of the complexity of the situation. I mean, how it came, how it came. Evolved, what is the whole idea of, of uh, toppling the uh, communist movement there, and so on. And international politics, global politics, and powers were involved in that. Different story altogether. But generally speaking, the Asian situation is quite different from the Arab situation, and this is why you find their responses, because they take religion seriously, they respond. No crackdown on them when they go to the street. It is different if, if they go in Cairo or in, uh, in, in Iraq or in Syria or somewhere else, they expect a crackdown on them. They will be beaten by the police. Actually, for any gathering, for any demonstration, they will be beaten. And as such, we don't expect them to react even on these occasions. They are afraid. Go to Mahmoud Darwish writing, memory in the flesh, for instance, and it will tell you. It will tell you exactly why the Algerians and other Arab uh, countries, uh, I mean, uh, other uh, Arab citizens, were separating the football more than anything else. Because they were not given a chance for anything else. That was the only possibility for them. Only the football is allowed by the region. And they can celebrate that. 
a victory or failure or whatever or something. But no, nothing wrong. Anything which is political, no. That is, and Mahmoud Darwish actually noticed that when he, he, was, he was trying to figure out why it is only the football that people go to this. Because this is the only one which is allowed to them. Questions? Since I have the microphone, let me ask you a question. How would you actually apply uh, similar notions that you discussed to the situation in Bahrain? Since uh, it's a very unique uh, uprising there, it's different from other countries. What would you comment on that? You know, take into consideration, of course, sectarian uh, composition of, of that specific country. Yeah, I mentioned that recently. Certainly, first of all, if we believe that there is a role for the social media, right? Al Jazeera was not very supportive or not enthusiastic. Well, they mentioned a few things and they left simply because the Saudis told them no. So that is very important to notice. The other thing is endemic to the revolution itself in Bahrain. They have already, when you are a majority, you don't need to claim it in the street that you are a majority. You are already 70%. You don't need to. Because the moment you claim something which you already have, you are defeated. You are losing. That is tactically a mistake. The other, tact, uh, a mistake, the other mistake is that you shouldn't come with an agenda. And they came with an agenda. As I told you, these popular revolutions are leaderless. They don't have leaders. The moment you come with leaders, you fail the concept of the popular revolution, that is to say. And, and that is, again, another tactical failure. So these helped towards the, uh, the end of the week. And this circle, the crackdown itself, that is the Verde Jazeera or the uh, the desert shield of Saudi Arabian army went there. By agenda, do you mean uh, Iranian agenda? Uh, no, the Shia, this is usually practically in the official or the formal discourse, especially the uh, uh, discourse which is influenced by the Saudi Arabia, usually in the Arab world, all over, all over. Anything that the same thing is usually Iran. So the accusation is ready. I mean, you need to have a power from outside. Whether there is a link or there is no link, it doesn't matter. You don't ask about that. It doesn't mean that I'm saying that the Iranians are innocent. No. It means that that's a problem which we have whenever we discuss any discourse and how it is being formulated. Um, uh, thank you so much for um, hosting this. Um, workshop, or not hosting, but um, for the entire lecture. Um, my question comes with a um, recent um, outcome of the Tunisian um, election and how the um, popular Muslim party won and um, now you have a group trying to change um, or try to add um, or uh, how to uh, change like women's rights and how they're trying to make it illegal for men to marry more than four wives although in Islam you're, you, um, for men um, they're permitted to marry up to four wives um, and they're trying and or how the division of the inheritance is or um, that um, men get twice for women and but these, this group's trying to say that women and men should get the same um, division of the inheritance. Um, my question is, would that be a popular move or um, because they're trying to actually change the Quranic text because it is in the Quran, um, these concepts. Um, and because they're changing the Quranic text, would that move or that popular um, Would it be popular? Would that move? Would it be successful? Okay. Uh, the, your colleague is referring to the, to the votes, the majority of votes which were won by the Nahda, it is called party, the Awakening Party, led by Ghanoushi, who is a professor of philosophy, by the way, and who leads that movement, religious Islamic movement which is very moderate 
movement, by the way, very moderate, despite the fact that Ben Ali tried to uh, describe it otherwise, very moderate. Ranushi was interviewed, and he was asked all these questions. And he, there is no reason for him to lie, because he is a winner. In the election, he can say whatever he likes, right? He said, first of all, let us not discuss the question of polygamy. Tunisia has been always very much receptive to the idea and the, uh, constitutionally of one wife, one man, and that's the end of it. And so it is done this way. He said, well, and even that was not successful in Tunisia because men at the age of 45, they could not afford to get married. They don't have the money. That was the situation in Tunisia. So you have the majority of women are unmarried, actually, in Tunisia. Who is going to marry more than one? If you are already, you cannot, I mean, if you have something like 65% of the population unmarried, how is it possible to talk about that? So he's raised that question, which is very logical, by the way. And uh, as I told you, I lived there for eight years, myself. I know. The other thing, which when it is inheritance, on any discussion of inheritance, is usually oriented, interest oriented. It is not religious. It has nothing to do with religion. Religion accepts what is available at that time. And the Meccan society used to have a number of wives before the Prophet simply because they need the inheritance to be divided among them. They don't want it to go outside their families. That's all. So right now, there is no point in arguing the case as inheritance then is not an, a, an innocent issue by itself. It has something to do with it, with interest and economy in general. So that is something, and the man knows that. And then the questions, he said, I'm not acting for his party alone. We are a coalition government, and all of us will have a dialogue on anything. And, and there are questions which we leave them to the people, to their practices. My suggestion, though, is that in the monarchic regimes before the coming of the nation state, they used to have very many law courts. That is, you have for this law, for the other court, and so on. And it is up to you as an individual to go and have your marriage contract accordingly to the law which you choose. So, it used to be the case, by the way, in Iraq and very many other countries. So, why the argument? No point. Just have multiple courts to deal with these uh, issues. 